Good morning, everyone. My name is Anastasia Ryazanova, and I'm a coordinator of the Tree Search Research Infrastructure. And today I would like to welcome you to the webinar that will be hosted by the Tree Search team from RICE. And in particular, it will be Anita Telemann, Thomas Larsson, Johan Alfton, and Christina Yunel. So you will be listening today to the topics of the wide X-ray scattering, um, then also dynamic mechanical analysis, oxygen and water vapor transmission rate testing, and also cross-polarized magnetic angle spinning NMR, and also small X-ray scattering and fib fiber saturation point measurements. Uh, Anita will also give you an introduction in general to the research, research infrastructure at RICE. So it will be quite um, intense, one and a half hours, but uh, we hope you will like it. And if you have any questions, please feel free to raise your hand or to pose the questions directly in the Q&A or in the chat. With this, I would like to give the word to Anita Telemann. And uh, Anita, please go ahead and try to share your slides and give us an introduction. Uh, thanks, Anastasia, for a very nice introduction. So my name is Anita Thielman, and I'm coordinator of Tree Search Research Infrastructure at RISE. In RISE major project, neutron and photon-based technologies for large-scale research infrastructure, such as MAX4 and ESS, I am the coordinator of RISE technical experts. So the program of today is, as Anastasia mentioned, first introduction, and I will talk about VAX. Thomas Larsson will talk about uh, CPMOS and more, SACS and FSP. Johan Alfton about DMA. And Christina Yonell about OTR and WVTR. Uh, RICE research infrastructure that is available for three research researchers is located in Stockholm, close to KTH campus Valhalla, Bergen. Analysis by SACSVAX, solid state and more, and FSP give complementary information. You will hear more in Thomas Larsen's presentation. Testing by DMA is one of several mechanical testing methods at uh, RISE. Measurement of OTR, WVTR are part of RISE barrier analysis test line. At first, we have a well-functional project organization and infrastructure to handle contract work. We have specialist competence. We can, we can give advanced user support. We have experience from several fields. We can give advice and help in planning and setting up experiment. We can do analysis and interpretation support as well. We are Sweden's research institute. We are approximately 3,000 employees, net sales 3,396 million Swedish crowns, founded in 2016, and we have more than 130 test beds and demonstration environments. The biorefinery testbed is very relevant for Tree Search Society as a key factor in developing new products for the emerging bioeconomy of testbeds where research results and new concepts can be scaled up. The hub is in Örnkolsvik for the investment of 350 million Swedish crowns. In the coming webinar, you will hear more about the biorefinery testbed. So now I will uh, talk about wide angle X-ray scattering uh, and have a focus on orientation of polymers. In small angle X-ray scattering, wide angle X-ray scattering and X-ray crystallography, the incident X-ray beam interacts with the sample. The methods deliver structural information of different dimension. Uh, XRD, more atomic resolution, 
vex high resolution and sex a low resolution. So what does VAX really measure? Yeah, VAX is a non-destructive method used to analyze the structure of more order or crystalline materials. It provides information on crystal structure, phase, preferred crystal orientation, texture, and other structural parameters. So characterization of the non-structure of materials provides an opportunity to understand the relationship between process, structure, and material properties. So I will not talk about determination of orientation by VAX measurements. So in 2D VAX diffractograms of dispersions and powders, uh, observe, you observe scattered signals of, in rings and they have equal intensity in the rings. And they're showing that the particles are randomly distributed. In two-dimensional wax diffractograms of dispersion of fibers and shared, shared liquids, a systematic variation in diffraction signal intensities is observed, showing a preferred orientation. In the diffractogram, red is high signal intensity and blue is low signal intensity. In 2D VEX diffractogram single crystals, very sharp signals are observed. So when you look at orientation, you can talk about three cases. We have random or isotropic, we have partial orientation, and we have a complete orientation, as it is in single crystal. So here's an example of analysis done together with Lulio University of Technology. The orientation of cellulose nanofiber filaments in epoxy composites is determined by reducing the two dimensional VAX data by asymmetric integration. So, in this ring here, we see when we start here that the intensity is a little bit lower. When we go around the ring at different angle, we see that the intensity increases, its highest point is up here and then the intensity decreases again, and we get to another low intensity value. So here we can find a maximum, we can find a baseline. So uh, the orientation index can be calculated according to this orientation, or according to this equa equation. Here, FWHM is full width at half maximum uh, of the signal. So if uh, all polymers in the sample are aligned in the same direction, this is a very sharp signal. Uh, so it's approaching almost zero. Then we get 180 minus zero divided by 180. That is, FC is almost one. If all the polymers are randomly distributed, uh, we have very broad signal. So FC approaches zero. For CNF in epoxy composites, the orientation index was 0 0.6. The analysis of degree of orientation can be done in different ways. There are two examples of orientation index and order parameter. And as you see, it's not the same ticket. And that is really indicating as well, when you compare samples, it is very important to use the same analysis method. So 
So here's another example of orientation of polymers. And uh, uh, th this has been done uh, together with Luleå University of Technology within research, research infrastructure. So the idea was to uh, use the processing technique solid state drawing so by calendaring, stretching at 60 degrees Celsius, the amorphous polylactic acid chain uh, will be more ordered and thereby the film uh, will obtain better mechanical properties. So let's see at the results. So this is the VAX uh, result. In the first row, we see results from the calendar field sample. In the second row, we see results from the uh, calendar field with solid state drawn. And the draw ratio is four. Final length is four times longer uh, than the original length. We see large differences between samples in the 2D VAX diffractograms. By reducing the data by radial integration, we can examine the degree of crystallinity. We observe a broad signal in the amorphous polymers of calendar field. Various both sharp from crystalline polymers and broad signals from amorphous polymers are observed for the solid state drawn film. Showing that the film contains both crystalline and amorphous polylactic acid. The degree of crystallinity increasing by solid state growth. By reducing the data by azimuthal integration, we can examine degree of orientation. The scattering is uniformly distributed around the center of the polymers in calendar field, showing that the polylactic acid is randomly oriented. Intense signals of uh, intensity are in one direction are observed for the solid state drawn film, showing that the polylactic acid polymers are partially oriented with a high degree of orientation. So in summary, the processing technique solid state drawing results in increase of the degree of orientation and the degree of crystallinity in polylactic acid polymers. When we look at mechanical properties, we observe that the tensile modulus, tensile strength, elongation at break, work of fracture are improved by the solid state law. And the degree of orientation is very high at this drawn, solid state drawn sample. So the orientation of polylactic acid and polymers has an effect on structure, has an effect on mechanical properties, and as well as thermal properties. More information can be found in the article. Mm, several people at Luleå University of Technology have been involved in the study. So, orientation of polymers can affect properties in, for example, wood-based materials, in sheets, in films, in filaments, threads. So, um, are you curious about structure and nanostructure of all of your material? Contact us. Oh. Thanks. Thank you so much, Anita. Uh, really interesting presentation. And now we got an overview of the VOX. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm wondering if someone from the audience has any questions. No? Probably the questions will come later. I just want to encourage all of you to make sure that you post your questions in the Q&A or chat or raise your uh, hand. And uh, let's go directly to Thomas, right? I think it's the turn of Thomas to talk to us about the NMR, FSP and SACS, right? Yes, that I will. 
Wonderful. So okay, I'll con I'll continue and uh, where Anita left off. So I'm going to talk about uh, basically three or four techniques that we use to to look at the nanostructure of the fiber wall, and it's NMR or cross polarization magic angle carbon thirteen NMR and FSP and Saxon wax. And I come back to the details of this technique, but I thought that it might be proper to give some background to, as to why, why are we, why do we have this? Why do we sort of have these techniques in house? And historically, so we have been very interested in, in pulping, of course, and turning wood into uh, pulps. And, uh, and these pulps are made or used to make other materials and so on. And you, traditionally it's been paper, board, tissue, textiles, etc. And the point is that the fiber wall on structure, you, you process that quite a lot when going from wood to pulp. You take away lignin and hemicellulose and stuff like that. And that affects the non structure of the fiber wall. And it turns out that the non structure of the fiber wall is a, an important controlling factor for the properties, both mechanical and chemical properties of the material that you make out of pulp fibers. So uh, for that reason, we have, a, have had a large interest in this. And that's actually the focus where we have used these techniques. They are more versatile than that, but that's our background, so to speak. And of course, there is an open research area around the fact that the understanding of how processing chemistry affects the final fiber wall structure is not that well understood. So we are still using this technique for that. And in, especially when we come to using pulps and wood-based fibers for other purposes in the traditional paper making, this is even more sort of uh, interesting and, and more challenging. And for that, and that's the background and reason why we have these techniques available. Because if you want to look at the fiber wall nanostructure, it's actually necessary, I would say, to have these techniques. If you don't understand, if you can't see and measure what you are doing to the fiber wall interior, which is a rather small scale of a dimension, you can't really tell how to control other things either. So, but I would also like to point out that you can interrupt me at any time and ask questions. You can do it in the chat, or if you just want to unmute and interrupt me, that's just fine. So we have these four techniques and we have this long and cumbersome acronym, which is basically CBMOS C13 NMR, which is a high resolution form of solid state NMR that is suitable for semi-crystalline organic solids. And I mean, cellulose is one of those. We have the FSP, which is a size seclusion technique that we use to measure the pore volume of a fiber. So we have small angle X-ray scattering, which is looking at larger structures, mainly supramolecular structure of, of the cellulose and, and other components. And then we have, as Anita has illustrated, the wide angle X-ray scattering also, which is giving us measurements on things that are smaller. I would say that size range wise, sax is maybe one to 100 nanometer and wax is typically below a nanometer. All these four are available through the three search portal. So you, you can apply for time and use there. But to put things into context, we have the wood fiber, which has been our main interest. And of course, we are going down from, from right to left to smaller and smaller structures. And eventually we end up with a description or a model of the fiber wall interior. And we are still sort of elaborating under the doctrine that cellulose is the load bearing component of a fiber wall and hence the material we make from pulp fibers. So we are having large interest in cellulose and what happens to that material when we do processing of different kinds. And it's a rather complicated structure you have to deal with when you are looking into a fiber wall. You have cavities and you have strands that are typically in the nanometer range or tenth of nanometer range, and they can have layered structures and so forth. So this is actually a material that is it's difficult to um, characterize because of its smallness, both of the cavities and the sort of the strands you see in the in this picture. But what we need to get 
hold of or the measurements that we need to understand or, or the things that we need to measure, I should say, is actually dimensions. Let me turn on my pointer. Dimensions of typical dimensions of these strands, widths typically, and also dimensions of what's in between the cavities. And to put it in a simple manner, you can say that, well, the NMR, the Saxon wax, mainly give us information about the solids, I mean, the dimensions of the particles or the strands, and FSB gives us information about what's, what's not there, the cavities in between. So we can measure both uh, fibril and fib what we call fibril and fibril aggregate thickness, the degree of crystallinity, specific surface area of the cellulose, in the water swollen state by NMR. FSB gives us basically the pore volume of the fiber wall. And of course, you have cavities of different size depending on processing conditions. If you push your pulping far, you will have more cavities and possibly some collapse. But you can also start to combine technique uh, measurements. For, so for the water swollen uh, samples we work, we can combine NMR and FSP to get some form of average pore size in the fiber wall. We have the wax for the interior structure of the fibril, I mean the smallest building block, and we can get cellulose crystallinity and crystallite size and things on that, and then small angle x-ray scattering, scattering which gives us complementary information to NMR on fibril and fibril aggregate dimensions, and also in some cases we can also get pore sizes. Now, another thing that is, might, could be pointed out, that is, in order to get some kind of numerical or quantitative value, some SAX measurement, it's normally a good idea to do modeling. And when you do that modeling, you actually need measures of the average density of what you measure. And here FSP plays a role once again for the SAX modeling. You can use that measurement to estimate the average density of the fiber wall in the water swollen state to speak. So they, they combine and they sort of complement all these techniques. So I'll start out with solid state and more simply because that's the technique we have been working with the longest. And uh, uh, typically solid state and more spectra from recorded on cellulose look something like this. And if you're familiar with carbon-13 NMR measurements on solutions, you see that we don't have these very sharp singlets that we typically have in carbon-13 spectra recorded in solution. And the reason for that is that we can see the fine structure or actually the supramolecular structure in the solid state. Basically how our polymers and building blocks are packed together. And we have used this technique for a long time and it's been actually a quite useful toolbox that has opened quite a lot new of new opportunities we can get porosity solubility honification water interaction strength properties enzymatic degrada degradation and measures of lots of structural features that are important for both chemical and mechanical properties uh, in fact this is a highly water responsible, uh, uh, highly re water responsive material. And that is immediately visible also if you look at spectra recorded and wet and dry material. And this is a rather long story, but I just show you this as an illustration that we see differences in the supramolecular structure that comes as a fact as, or as a consequence of, of swelling. Well, spectra look like this and the, the take home message from this picture is basically that these are all the same molecular structure, the same polymer, but they look obviously quite different depending on where we have isolated the cellulose from. From bottom to top, we have algae, we have a, an animal, we have cotton and birch. And that variation gives us exactly the kind of information we were looking for. And it turns out that in this region, what's called the C4 region, it's easiest to get access to that. And you can do that by, well, it's a form of modeling, of course, it's spectral fitting. You look at, uh, uh, you model the spec as a set of discrete signals, and then you can connect these discrete signals to different polymer states of order that you have in a bundle of a fibril, and a bundle of fibrils, which we call a fibril aggregate. 
And you can, from this, get estimates of dimensions, and you can get estimates of crystallinity, and you can get estimates of specific surface area, and so on. In simple terms, we get separate signals from polymers sitting on surfaces compared to the total. So we can estimate the surface to volume ratio. And if you do this the proper way, you can compute sizes from that. And NMR is a bulk technique, so we get representative measurements. We don't get distribution, but representative measurements for every all the sample we put into the sample holder, so to speak. And that's quite useful. Well, if you are dealing with cellulose and cellulose-rich samples, we pretty much know the density of cellulose. And that means that as soon as we have the dimension of the material, we can also estimate the specific surface area. And this is especially useful in the water solvent state because there aren't that many techniques that can do that, but NMR is one of them. So that's a useful measure. And you can see that we have two because we have two structural, basic structural elements in our model. And that is the fibril that has around 700 square meters per gram. And we have the normally larger fibril aggregates that are around 100 square meters per gram. So we can get these numbers out. Um, fiber saturation point measurement. The, um, this is a solute exclusion technique that uh, we are using to measure or take measures of the fiber wall pore volume. And a solute exclusion technique in a simple fashion is basically a technique where we look at the water that is entrapped in pores that are too small for a very large polymer to enter. This technique was originally developed as a pore size distribution technique, but we don't use it like that because there are complications with that, this determinate, determining the distribution, but we only use it in one end or at one limit, so to speak, when we have large polymer is in solution and we have pores that are typically smaller than the polymer is, or the, the hydrodynamic radius of the polymer. And the way it's done is that we mix pulp with a dextran solution and we keep track of the amount we have of pulp and the amount of water. And then you can basically calculate what would the dextran concentration be. You compute that theoretically from knowledge of your sample. And then you measure it with uh, optical rotation. And when the, when the tech or the method is used uh, properly, the concentration that you measure of the dextra normally comes out higher than the theoretical value. And the reason for that is simply that we have water trapped in pores that cannot dilute the dextra solution. And just looking at the difference between the two measures, we can estimate the, num the amount of water trapped in the fiber wall pore system per unit solids or solid mass. And that turns out to be very useful. There is a less advanced, less complicated technique that is related to this, which is the water retention value. But the water retention value is, uh, it's connected with so many other complications that we prefer to use this FSP technique, although it takes much longer time, but it's much more reliable. Typically, you can say that water retention value and FSP, they, they correlate normally, not always, but normally. But in absolute numbers, they are very different, or they can be very different. Then, once you have an estimate of the fiber wall pore volume, you can combine that with the measurement of the specific surface area that you can get from solid state and more. And for cellulose, and this works well for cellulose rich samples. And what this means basically is that you have a specific pore volume and you have a specific surface area. And if you divide the volume by the area, you get a length. And that length is essentially the thickness of the water layer that you would have had if you smeared all that water or that, that water volume over the all that area. And that's the number T indicated by T here. And that's essentially half the average pore size of the fiber wall. And this can be estimated by combining NMR and FSP. Uh, and we can get the number for the average pore size. 
uh, without having to assume any particular pore shape. And that's a, a difficult trick to achieve, but it works and it worked quite well. And we have compared uh, these measurements with another technique that's used frequently, which is BET, the Brunauer Emetelle technique for estimating pore size and specific surface area. And the BAT technique requires that you dry your sample prior to measurement, which we don't have to do with the, <clears throat> with the combination of N solid state NMR and FSP. And that means that FSP and solid state NMR typically, that method is normally an upper bound for what you can get from BAT, which we also is what we find. So in that respect, it's a technique when you, it's not simple, I wouldn't say that, but it's a way you can combine FSB and solid state NMR and you can avoid the problems associated with, with preparing sample for other techniques that measure the same thing. So Anita has been talking about wide angle, angle X-ray scattering, orientation and so forth. We use it for other things as well. And we just want to look at material and I don't know how familiar you are with the technique, but if you have a cellulose fibril and what the, what the wax wide angle X-ray scattering actually gives us information about is the state of water in the interior of the fibril when you apply it to cellulose. And it, it looks uh, something like this. This is a highly crystalline or reasonably high crystalline cellulose material that is copper linters. And if you take it one step further and start to look at the wet or water swollen cellulose rich pulp, it looks similar, not as good, but similar. But you can also identify signals that comes from the different crystallographic planes that you have in such a crystal. And you can see that you get these signals out. And this is a basically a classification of cellulose one. You can almost define cellulose one or the crystalline lattice of cellulose one by this technique. So, uh, you can make a positive confirmation that indeed we have cellulose one. And then you, when you start to do chemical modification and do other things, you can also follow through how that changes the material. And this is an example that shows you when, what happens when we do a carboxymethylated cellulose or a CNF. And it's uh, the blue line is the pulp prior to any modification and the uh, brownish line is what it looks like after chemical modification and homogenization. And still, one thing to point out here is that we are still looking at the interior of the fibril. So although when we do the chemical modification with, with carboxymethylation, we add, we oxidize mainly the surface polymers of the fibril, the combined effect of this oxidation and mechanical homogenization actually impacts quite a lot of distortion in the interior of the fibril. And I think this is something that is important to understand when you want to go one step further and start to understand the, the sort of mechanical and chemical properties of this material uh, when you start to make uh, films, filaments or whatever from them. You can also do measurements more difficult because of low solid contents, but with solid state and more. But you see from the solid state and the more when you come to this pulp and carboxymethylated, carboxymethylated CNF example, you see pretty much the same thing from, from NMR. We lose crystallinity and we start to mess up the interior of our fibril. And I think this is the point because much of the measurement we do ends up with results that are rather difficult to interpret and they can be complicated and can be difficult and so on. And having two techniques that confirms each others, uh, that confirm each other is really important when you are looking for reliability in the sort of interpretations that you try to do from this. So bringing these two techniques together is a very good thing and it's a very sort of uh, good way of verifying that your uh, very, your interpretation is sort of going the right way. Your understanding for the material and the changes you make in the material is verified by two different techniques. And there are prin principles of operation that are widely different, of course. One is spectroscopy and the other one is scattering. So that this is also something that's very helpful. 
small angle x-ray scattering when we use x-ray to look at larger structures we can do that and we can also compare that in some cases with the solid state and more measurements of course but you can see that we have once again from dry and wet material we have rather drastic differences in in the measured response blue is wet brown is dry and the interpretation is basically this that in the dry state we have a more compact structure fewer pores, denser material, and when you swell the material, you get back to this structure of fibrils, basically, and fibril aggregates, possibly, and uh, cavities, water-filled cavities in between. Now, the SACS measurement, as you can see, they are more featureless and not so rich in detail as the other samples. In order to get some quantitative results from those, you need to resort to some form of modeling. But that can, of course, be done. And that's the way you can get information both about the solids and the pore structure and so on. And another feature worth mentioning is also that in order to do the modeling, a very useful input for modeling is the average density of the fiber wall and that can actually be obtained from the FSP in the case of water swollen samples so that's helpful also here and it's also another combination of techniques that we utilize quite frequently so some final words uh, I show an example for mainly cellulosic materials I mean these techniques all of them they are very versatile and they can cover a much broader variety of materials than we have covered so far. And uh, we come across quite frequently questions about, can we measure this? And normally you can say for most of the techniques, the answer is typically yes. But the thing is that will the measurement yield any useful information? That's the problem really. And since there are so many different possibilities when it comes to measurements, we haven't actually run through them all. So, my recommendation is that if there is something you don't know and uh, samples that you haven't measured and we haven't measured, the sort of minimum trial to do is three samples to measure. If you have made this experimental series, you take the extremes or what you suspect to be the extremes, and then you need to have some kind of reference. So it's three samples, a reference and the two extremes. And we start out with that and you do this minimum set of measurements. If you don't see any difference, well, then you know that it's no point in going any further. If you do, then you can start to supply larger amount of samples. But in order to sort things out, when we don't have any previous knowledge, two extremes and a reference is my standard recipe of recommendation to answer the question if it's a useful way to go or not. As I mentioned, all techniques are available at the Tree Search portal. And if you have any questions, you are welcome to contact any one of us, Jasna, Anita, or me. Thank you for your attention. I am done. Thank you so much, Thomas. Very interesting presentation. And, you know, I totally agree with you that if you don't know anything about your sample, you must do at least three attempts. <laughs> That's yeah, how yeah. I also was raised for the scientific uh, uh, and research tests of the yeah. unknown samples. No, yeah, I mean, you can you can do you can measure much more than just cellulosic materials. Although that that's our main focus. But when we have done, done I mean, Anita showed you we have done, uh, I mean, plastics, polyethylene, and, and and lots of other kinds of material. And so it's not that uncommon that we encounter samples that we have never sort of performed measurements on before. So mm. totally agree with you. Um, I don't see any questions of raised hands yet. Probably the questions will come at the end of the seminar. Uh, so we will have like a total Q&A session. So probably to be on time, let's move on to the world of DMA. And uh, Johan will give us a nice overview about it, right? Yes, I intend to do that. Pleasure is to welcome you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Johan Alton. I work as a senior researcher in paper mechanics at the, the RISE facilities in Shista. And uh, today I will present DMA, or as is, uh, it is usually called, both the method and the equipment. Uh, and that stands for dynamic mechanical analysis. And DMA is used to st study viscoelastic properties 
uh, that is time dependence of material. And that could be either something quite fast, you get rate effects in printing, for example, there you get different properties depending on how, how fast, fast you run your equipment. Or it could be slow gradual processes uh, like the boxes you see here that are stored for a quite long time. They look fine initially, but uh, during a long time loading, they will start to deform. And it looks like this and eventually they will collapse. And in this instrument, you can, um, which you see here, you see the load cell, which is quite small in here, or actually it's up here. Uh, this is the load cell. And uh, there you can apply different types of loading. You always apply a stress and that could be sinusoidal. So it varies over time, or it could be a constant stress, or it could be a, a combination. And in uh, every case, you measure the strain response. And uh, sinusoidal stress typically uh, correspond to dynamic viscoelastic uh, properties. So you get fast response, uh, for example, for printing applications, but of applications, slower applications also. Or you can have a constant stress that's more like the static, a static creep test, which is a slow process. And I will start with the dynamic viscoelastic test. And this picture here shows schematically what, what the response in the, the input and the response of the material in the, in the instrument looks like. Uh, you get, uh, you put in a stress, which is the blue curve starting here. Uh, and you get the response that is the strain. And there is a certain uh, difference between them in time. And there we have a, a, a phase angle that differs between them. So if you look at uh, quick equations that, that um, describe these curves, they are both sinus with uh, amplitudes that I call sigma zero and epsilon zero here for the uh, stress and strain respectively. And you have an uh, angular frequencies omega here, here and uh, time t. And here you have a difference, that is the phase angle. And that will lead to a lag or a delay of the strain response, which is down here. That will be uh, this um, phase angle delta divided by the angular frequency omega. And then you can start to analyze what happens here and you can determine certain properties. And you can determine uh, uh, a storage modulus, which is uh, quite similar to stiffness or Young's modulus of a material, but it, it includes the uh, uh, phase angle that you have here. So it's the uh, amplitude of a stress, uh, sigma zero divided by the amplitude of a strain, uh, epsilon zero times cosine of, of uh, delta. And then you have a loss modulus uh, that uh, describes what happens out of plane. And that is related to dampening here, which causes this, this gap uh, between the curves. And that is sigma zero divided by epsilon zero times sinus. And the damping itself, you can determine as the tangents of delta, which will then be the loss modulus divided by the storage modulus. This is only valid if you have a, a linear material response. So it depends on the material and the region of, of loading you are in. Uh, but uh, that is quite important to remember when looking at this type of result that you can't look at nonlinear behavior of any kind. Uh, with this method, you can start to do uh, analysis and typically you make sweeps. And the first I will show is a frequency sweep. And this is a schematic picture of a very simple case just to see what's going on. And um, you have the storage modulus as a blue curve starting here. Uh, you have the red curve, which is the loss modulus. 
and you have the dampening, which is the ratio between them, which is the yellow curve. And uh, the storage modules start at a quite low value and then goes through at different frequencies. It starts increasing and end up at a much higher value in the end. And that could happen in several steps. It doesn't have to be just one. The loss modulus uh, start to increase while the uh, storage modulus increase and you also get the dampening there. And there you have the real dynamic effects that you can study. Uh, another quite important feature is that for that you use for a lot of polymers is that you can uh, look at these different properties and determine the glass transition temperature. Uh, and this is a borrowed example, but uh, what you see here is that you have a, a storage modulus here, uh, you have a loss modulus there, and you have a damping here. And at one point in temperature, the uh, storage module starts to drop quite rapidly and the, the damping increases. And at the minimum slope there, you will find the glass transition temperature because it is the glass transition that causes this, this change. So this is a way of determining um, glass transition temperatures and you can use it for a material that also has several glass transition temperatures, uh, but you have to be aware here that you shouldn't get any nonlinear effects because then this match will, be, will start to break down. So if you look at paper materials, which also tend to, uh, to absorb water, you will get a much more complex and typically nonlinear effects. And it could be quite hard to do this, but it works for many, many types of polymers. Then you can go to the other end where you just apply a constant stress. And this is what we have used for most, uh, mostly recently. And uh, here a stress is applied and uh, you measure the strain over time. And this shows an example where we start at a quite high relative humidity, constant humidity, constant stress, and it's 80%. And at this point over here, we start to cycle between 80 and 30% relative humidity. And we get a different slope. We get a different rate of deformation. And that is um, caused by an interaction of sorption and uh, mechanical loading. And it's called mechanosorptive creep at this point. Uh, and it's typically an acceleration creep. And this is a quite uh, nonlinear uh, phenomena. Uh, this um, stat, uh, when you do a static creep test, you don't really take advantage of having the DMA because you don't use the dynamic part of it. Uh, but on the other hand, you can measure with any type of material. It doesn't have to be uh, linear anymore. And in this case that I showed, not mechanics of the creep, it's typically not linear anymore. So that is something you can also use this instrument for. The equipment we have at RICE is a DMA Q800 from TA Instruments. That is a quite old device, but still very popular because it's, it's, uh, it's uh, very convenient to use. Uh, we have climate control, both temperature and RH. We have a, a, two different setups, so we can uh, determine how we can vary temperature and RH. And uh, we have different fixtures. We don't have that many, but you can get more if you need it for some special uh, applic uh, application. Uh, the two we have is a tensile stage shown here. And uh, just to indicate the size, the width of a sample you see here is five millimeters. Or this one is a compressive uh, stage. Uh, and that is mostly for using uh, to compress out of plane in the sub direction of the paper or paperboard. And it could be used typically for, for printing applications. Uh, 
And as I said uh, earlier, we at the moment uh, mostly use it for uh, uh, creep, creep test, the static test for testing mechanosorptive properties. But uh, we have in the past both tried to study mechanosorptive properties with the dynamic uh, uh, testing. Uh, that is quite difficult to interpret because of the nonlinearity. You can't use the standard method. Uh, but we also have done it for looking at, um, at uh, the response out of plane during printing, both of paper and, uh, and rubbers. And uh, that is where I will stop. And I'm happy to answer questions now. Or if you want to contact me later, here is my contact information. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Johan. A uh, really interesting presentation. It's probably the first time I'm listening so in detail about DMA. And indeed, it's a technique which is also highly needed and not available everywhere. Uh, I don't see immediate questions right now, so probably they will come at the end of the webinar. So I think uh, we should move on to the next speaker. And it will be Christina Yonel. Christina, are you with us? I'm with you. I am. I'm with you. Great, Christina. If you can possibly try to share the slides. Yes. So Christina will give us an introduction to the oxygen and water vapor transmission rate testing, OTR and WVTR. So Christina will be the last speaker of today. That's why I urge you all who have any questions to make sure that you come up with them before we end the session and post them in the chat or Q&A. Otherwise, you always can also email the speakers uh, and also me uh, later on if you come up with any questions. Thank you. So uh, my name is Kristina Juvenal and uh, I'm a, I am working at RISE uh, with research and development of uh, bio-based barrier materials. And I'm also responsible for our barrier laboratory. And I will now uh, present what we can offer regarding uh, oxygen and water vapor transmission rate testing, OTR and VVTR. And on uh, this picture is shown the barrier laboratory. Uh, we are the largest independent uh, uh, permeability testing facility in the Nordic countries. Uh, we measure OTR and VVTR on both the films and packagings. And uh, our different uh, instruments uh, measure different uh, uh, testing ranges and precision. We support uh, customers from both uh, the academia and the industry. And the quality assurance is uh, a priority for the barrier lab. Uh, we regularly test uh, film samples from Smithers Pira to verify that our measurements are comparable with ad other laboratories. We uh, have support from uh, the instrument manufacturer, Amtec, Mukon, uh, to assure that our equipment is fully functional. What is an OTR value? Uh, OTR is the steady state of uh, the diffusion rate of oxygen uh, through a specified film or uh, at a specified uh, temperature and humidity. Uh, the one of the common units uh, are cubic centimeter per square meter per day. Uh, Common test conditions are 23 degrees Celsius, 50% relative humidity, or 38 degrees Celsius and 90% relative humidity. Uh, and uh, an instrument can measure, uh, has two test cells, which makes it possible to measure two samples at the same time or a double samples. 
The samples will uh, then be placed in this test cell. And on one side, oxygen will flow. And on the other side, dry nitrogen will flow. This will uh, cause a concentration difference, uh, which will be the driving force for the diffusion of oxygen to the side with a lower concentration. The most common is to use 100% oxygen uh, at a pressure of one atmosphere. What is a VVTR value? It is measured in a similar way. Uh, thus, uh, VVTR is the steady state of the diffusion rate of uh, water molecules uh, going through a film at a spec specified temperature and humidity. So in this case, uh, water vapor is flowing on the wet side and on the dry side nitrogen. A concentration difference is created which will be the driving force. Compared to oxygen, uh, there will be, you will have uh, differences in vapor pressure depending in which climate uh, that is chosen. So uh, besides uh, the activated diffusion driven by the concentration difference, uh, the permeability will be influenced but by many other factors, uh, such as uh, the measurement conditions, the temperature, re relative humidity, film properties, the film test area, film thickness, the sample that many times is a polymer, the polymer properties, crystallinity, uh, amorphous parts, the chemical structure of the polymer, polar versus non-polar, surface properties, and last but not the least, the permeant, uh, oxygen, for example, or water vapor, the size, the shape, and the polarity of the molecule. If we look at the uh, test area and the thickness, the area needs to be defined as uh, the value is related to the area. And this is made with aluminium foil masks at different sizes. Uh, the uh, sur surface area can be up to 50 square centimeters. There are several reasons for using a small area. Maybe you have uh, only small samples available. The sample could be fragile. And it has been experienced that uh, with a smaller area, the leakage will be reduced. The film thickness uh, needs to be a maximum of two to three millimeters. So the area will affect the value. As you see in the table, the smaller the area, the lower the accuracy, but the larger measurement range. And we have different types of equipment. We have Aquatron 1 and Oxtron 2, the 221, uh, which are equipment uh, that gives medium to high level barriers. To measure very high, very high level barriers, we have uh, uh, new equipment, Aquatron 3 and Oxtron 22, which uses a new technology with cassettes. With the new equipment, uh, the detection level will go down, as you see in the table, uh, for Aquaton 3, down to 5 raised to minus 4 for VVTR, Aquaton 3, and for Oxtron 2, 22, five raised to minus three. The test temperature is in the range five degrees Celsius to 50 degrees Celsius. Uh, and this is uh, the limitation is due to the heat sensitivity of the sensor.
So if a value is needed uh, at a condition outside the instrument's temperature range, outside 5 to 50 degrees Celsius, you could solve this by doing a series of measurements at different temperatures, 10 to 40 to 50. Then using the Arrhenius equation with a linear extrapolation will give you the result. If Tg is within the, the test range, uh, two linear functions will be required. Our new equipment uh, for testing of very high level barriers have diffusion cells inside the instrument. This will reduce the leakage when measuring. Also, uh, the diffusion cells on the pictures to the right, you can see have two O-rings. This will also help out reducing the leakage. To, per to perform packaging measurements, we also have a climate chamber where different climates can be set up. The usual climate is 23 degrees Celsius, 50% relative humidity, or a tropical climate. As in this picture, we have a half packaging that has been glued to a copper plate with copper tubes. Copper tubes are then connected to the instrument. A calculated value for shelf life can be obtained from these packaging measurements. The Barrier Lab has uh, experience of investigation of many different types of uh, materials. This could be everything from ultra-high barrier films such as OLED to bio-based materials. Also packagings can be measured as I shown in the previous slide. Here are examples of measurements of different types of materials. To the left, you see transmission rate versus time for a oil-based material. And you see the steady state is reached quickly. To the right, you see a bio-based material where the steady state is reached more slowly. So uh, this is a short summary of what, we, what the Barrier Lab could offer. Uh, we could per perform oxygen and water vapor transmission rate, and we could also provide calculated values, for example, permeance. Uh, we can uh, uh, extrapolate outside the instrument temperature interval by Arrhenius plot. Uh, instrument uh, temperature, uh, you also see here uh, uh, on the second point, the lowest detection limits that could be achieved. We can also perform packaging measurements in a climate chamber, and the lowest detection limit is given in the slide. We can determine shelf life based on both packaging and film measurements. A hydrogen leak detector can be used to locate effects on packaging and films. And if it's done before the OTR and VVTR, uh, this will reduce uh, the number of failed measurements. So finally, we could be a discussion partner concerning the choice uh, of experimental planning, and we could help out interpreting results. And this is possible as we have researchers in the barrier area with the solid instrument knowledge, uh, collaborating with other researchers in the field. And uh, then um, it's finished. And I, do you have any questions? You are very welcome.
Thank you so much, Christina. Um, so, really nice presentation, Christina, and also all the speakers. Uh, so, everyone in the audience, it's your last chance to ask the questions to the speakers. If you don't have any immediate questions right now, you can always uh, email all the speakers and uh, you can also email me and in general research and we would be happy to help you to get in contact with a corresponding specialist. This webinar will be also available later on demand on the YouTube um, and on the research website. So keep uh, your eyes open and we will also try to organize more similar webinars in the future for the other uh, infrastructures that we have accessible through the research. And um, I don't see questions right now. No, well, I think people are thinking I could just continue a little bit uh, of Thomas uh, very yeah. nice. Saying that uh, it is very wise to, to, to I mean, do uh, reference and two extremes. Uh, and we see that very valuable and are very happy about discussing uh, your samples. Um, it has been very valuable to, to have a very short uh, introduction first of the methods and see uh, what kind of sample and how to best do of you, in your hypothesis and your, your system. Mm -hmm. So that we are very, very uh, you're very welcome to, to, to uh, contact us if you have those kind of questions. So, so we have had very many contacts, especially from KTH. It's a close by. That, that's that's typically. Uh, but but I mean, uh, at other, I mean, from Lund and Lulia and so on as well. So, so yeah, you're very welcome to contact us. Yes, indeed, Anita. I totally agree with you. And also, when you go to the research website and you see the instructions how to fill in the request to get access to the infrastructure please try to do like anita is saying try to describe your research question in simple way but so that the specialist will understand but then of course after your application is received we book the follow-up discussions and then look into the peculiarities in details so don't be uh, afraid and <laughs> go ahead and book your session with a specialist the big benefit applying through the tree search infrastructure is that tree search for all associates and for all granted applications, uh, we are um, giving you the financial support. So basically, tree search is covering the um, specialist time. So that's one of the benefits. And besides this, also you get the uh, well significant involvement of the specialist into this discussion and the follow ups and everything. So don't be um, uh, afraid to contact and to discuss and to book your time as a specialist and send the applications also. 